Welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to give it a couple of minutes for more folks to join and then we will get started. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to Lightning Talks. Um, these are talks that we usually host once a month, and we're always looking for speakers. If you're interested, there's a sign-up sheet that you can sign up for. You can basically talk about anything that you like, um, a project that you're working on, a conference that you went to, um, things that you've learned that you'd like to share uh, with folks. Um, feel free to sign up and you can reach out to um, us, the organizers. I'm, and by the way, I'm Satari. I'm a researcher with Mozilla and one of, one of the organizers of Lightning Talks. And, um, and we're more than happy to help you figure out, you know, the topic that you want to talk about and what you'd like to focus on. The only requirement is that these are usually five minutes or less. So um, hopefully like not a huge lift for folks as they're uh, preparing their talk. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Today we have um, some wonderful speakers who have signed up uh, for the day. So Mike is going to be uh, talking to us about artist dreams and overfitting to an AI future. A Amy is going to take us through Figma and share some of her uh, tips and tricks. Sahir is going to be talking about MozFest um, that's coming up. And Nicole is going to be telling us a little bit more about feminist human computer interaction. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Mike. Mike, I think you might be muted. Oh, that shortcut didn't work. Hello, <laughs> I'm Mike, I'm a design technologist on Ocho. Uh, I'm gonna attempt to tackle the concepts of art, AI, climate and dreams in under five minutes or less. Uh, so no big lift at all. <laughs> uh, next slide. <clears throat> when I uh, first started learning AI, I was fascinated by this thing called the latent space. Um, it's a way of essentially opening up an AI's brain and uh, looking at what it's seeing as it trains um, and attempts to make sense of the human world uh, above are some of my early prototypes. Uh, and what I liked about this was the weird imperfection and unexpected surprises you got. Uh, I thought this would be an amazing tool in the hands of an artist, uh, but the technical barriers were pretty high. The purpose of the course was to lift some of those technical barriers for artists. Next slide. Uh, nowadays, AI has its hooks in everything. Uh, we've gone from the latent to the hyper-real. Uh, these amazing logos generated by Mozilla's John Rice are a great example of what's possible. Uh, the, the AI things that we used to require time-intensive tools and complex, expensive systems can now be conjured with a browser text field and a prompt engineer. Uh, we've even got stable diffusion rendering images from our brain activity, as I learned a couple of days ago. Next slide. Uh, so to find out if and how artists are using AI today, I decided to ask the person I thought least likely to want to do so, my friend Peter Burr. Uh, this is Peter. He's an artist, professor, PhD candidate at RPI. Uh, his work has been recognized by the Whitney, Guggenheim, and New Museums, among others. Uh, he made a career of subverting dominant aesthetics and narratives, most recently with an exhibit called Boomtown, uh, taking a cue from the towns that sprung up during the gold rush to attack, attract prospectors and speculators looking for the fast track to a better life. This metaverse artwork uh, changes dynamically based on the volatile crypto trading market on the Ethereum blockchain. Next slide. Peter told me he was using AI in a variety of ways. He said stable diffusion was helping him to quickly generate concept sketches for pitch decks and grant applications, and ChatGPT helped him 
ideate on the narratives that weave throughout his work. In some sense, AI has gone from a deep dreamer to a productivity tool. Next slide. These days, it's harder for me to see the technical barriers that need to be removed for people. In contrast, people actually are seeking out barriers against the inundation of tech. I stumbled across an artic article by Eric Hull uh, that referred to this landscape as the super sensorium and the feeling experienced as part of the overfitted brain hypothesis. Um, the hypothesis says that when you, uh, when you train a machine learning model too heavily on a particular data set, it gets great at solving those problems for that data, uh, but bad at solving for new information. That's called overfitting. Um, but in our brains, since the Mesozoic era, animals have dreamed as a way to introduce nuance to our routine lives. Without dreams, the hypothesis goes, our own minds are constantly at risk of overfitting as well. While sleep may be a cerebrospinal scrubbing of unnecessary memories, dreams uh, introduce nuance to the things we do remember. They allow our minds to extrapolate, prepare for new information, unexpected circumstances, etc. Next slide. Uh, in a way, I see the artist as serving a similar function for our society. They take a look at the overfitted aspects of our culture, and they try to spot the gaps, the cracks, the untold stories. They're sort of like seers. They reach in to untie the knots in our brain and introduce nuance and prepare us for unforeseen futures. Next slide. No unforeseen future looms more ominous to me than that of our planet. The internet consumes three times more energy than our current wind and solar power sources can provide with data traffic doubling every year, every two years, sorry. Uh, so what if the tech won't go the way of the super sensorium? What if the future's resilient networks, low energy devices, tech that gets out of your way, offline first tech that can adapt to rapid changes and unpredictable underlying infrastructure? Next slide. Or what if it's both? Uh, on Friday, I attended an exhibit um, at the Portland Art Museum by the artist Hito Steirel called This is the Future. Uh, the narrative centers on Hedja, who is sentenced to prison by a neural network that calculates she will one day commit a crime. In prison, she cultivates a garden that she protects from the guards by hiding it in the future. Here, the plants evolve through predictive powers of a neural network. These power plants learn to remedy a range of society's ills, social media addiction, a culture of overwork. Shiro paints a vision of, a, of nature capable of healing the present. This is a future where the societal status of the natural world is elevated. To me, it's an example of the artist showing us the lucid dreams needed by our overfitted brains. If you get a chance to see this exhibit in person, I definitely recommend it. A video really won't do it justice. Same is true of anything by Peter. Uh, and it's been if it's been a while since you've patronized the arts or gotten outdoors, uh, highly encourage you to support your local seers and exit the super sensorium. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. And with that, we'll pass it over to Amy. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give a quick intro to Figma today and just kind of show you some tips and tricks that I use in my uh, design workflow. Uh, so next slide. Um, some of you have heard, some of you folks might have heard Figma or used it before. Um, and if you're an expert already, uh, this might be a refresher for you folks. So just jumping right in here, what is Figma? The, the basic question of, of all. Uh, so Figma is a web-based design tool uh, where people can create designs and collaborate in real time with each other. I did mention web-based, but they do have a uh, desktop app as well. Uh, next slide. So what can Figma do? Uh, next slide. Uh, so here is a collage of all the different things I think that you can do in Figma. So you can build icons in Figma. So you can see a little you know, top left corner of an image showing the different icons you can create in it. Um, you can also create design systems. So um, you can build all sorts of design systems, um, which are basically made up of uh, design components. So quick shout out to all the folks who built design systems from scratch or are currently maintaining one. Um, there's a lot of work involved when it comes to uh, design systems. So shout out to those folks. Um, you can also create uh, low fidelity wireframes or mid-fi wireframes, whatever fidelity level you want. You can quickly mock up some user flows and what, you, what kind of content you might want uh, to live in a said frame. 
Um, you can also create very polished uh, visual design components as well. And then um, you can also create presentations. So I've used Figma to create presentations in the past, and there's just so much more control and things you can do using Figma. And then I separate this one out. So next slide, you can actually create clickable prototypes too. So here's a little quick GIF for a video um, of how, of a snippet of, you know, what's like to kind of put some interactions together using Figma. Hopefully it'll play. So yeah, I can create like, you know, your animation type. Here's like the, the view mode of the prototype. So you can do a lot of cool, fancy things with Figma. Um, next slide. So. This is a fun one. Uh, took me some time to create this slide. Uh, so this is the overview of Figma's user interface. I think most folks already know, um, you know, how the user, how to kind of interact with the user user interface of Figma. But I'm going to do a quick overview of it. Um, so next slide. So here, I just took a screenshot of my work area. So I create a Figma file named Tutorial. Um, so now I'm going to add the overlay on top to kind of talk through the different um, pieces of this UI. So next slide, Satari. Um, so here, quickly, left to right, um, here you've got your layer sections on the left. So like Adobe, Photoshop, or any you know, uh, photo or design tools, sorry, photo editing software programs you use or edit, uh, design tools you use, you have layers and kind of you know, uh, move them around, rename them. So anything you create in the work area will show up there. You've also got pages in Figma files, so you can kind of navigate through the different ones. So here we've got cover, a cover page, uh, section divider where you have your main uh, main pages like your presentation and activity pages. Uh, the little orange part is the orange, sorry, the main toolbar. So that's where all your main tools go. So your cursor, your frame creation, your shapes, your text um, tool, et cetera. And then um, at the top there is your file navigation bar. So you can actually have multiple um, Figma files open and kind of navigate it through like you would in a browser. And then the blue part is your main working area. So that's where you kind of create all your lovely designs, your mockups, your presentations and all that. Um, so Figma also has Figma huddle, which is kind of like Slack huddle, but in a Figma file. So if you um, turn that on or you join the Figma huddle, you and your collaborators can kind of chat um, as you're kind of working in the working area together. Uh, you can also share files, which I haven't highlighted there. Um, and then lastly, this right section part, there's design prototype inspect panels. Um, I didn't, I'm not going to dive too deep into prototype and inspect, but the prototyping, uh, the yeah, prototype panel there, if you click into that tab, we'll show you all the prototyping, uh, I guess, features and the way you can kind of like, you know, create interactions and connect and navigate screen, sorry, screens to different screens. Um, you can also inspect. So the inspect one is more for design uh, development handoffs. So you kind of see a more breakdown of the design properties um, and some of the styles that are used in a particular design. Um, and then design properties, which is the main one, which you'll probably be using mostly in Figma if you're designing and creating stuff. Uh, you can kind of tweak objects and elements change colors, add layers, add strokes, effects, and all that. And lastly, you can actually export stuff from Figma. So they made it super easy. Just click on an object, open up, expand the export area, and then just kind of export things as needed. So that's the quick overview of the UI. Um, so I did promise I would show some uh, tips and tricks too. So next slide, Satari. Um, so Figma is also great because there's a Figma community. So here you're able to kind of, you know, um, search up uh, templates, Figma, existing Figma files, or already uh, create, sorry, already made uh, design components to kind of quickly pull in to use into, you know, things that you're creating in Figma. So if you didn't get a chance to explore Figma community, I highly recommend it and check it out for yourself. And then lastly, just a couple of plugins, my favorite. Um, there's four. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so here are my favorite ones. Uh, Streamlines. So, you know, if you're looking for icons, this is a great plugin to kind of quickly pull in icons and just drop into your mockups. Um, the next plugin, oh, Autoflow. So, a really great way to kind of connect your screens and build user flows out. So, they kind of, um, you select elements together, hold shift and click it, and it'll kind of uh, auto create arrows that kind of show, you know, uh, what the user is doing next instead of you having to manually add the arrows yourself. You can also change the colors. Um, next plugin, there's two more. I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, contrast is great. So I always use this to double check to see if the colors I'm using are accessible or not. Um, so that's a great plugin to have. It'll show you what passes and what fails. You can kind of um, compare, yeah, the, uh, what's it called? Yeah, your text to your background to see if it's like readable as well. And then lastly, my favorite plugin of all time is Outline. So this is a great plugin uh, when it comes to design documentation and 
you know, uh, I guess like design to development handoff as it really speeds up that process. So you can kind of um, highlight the padding and the margin size and the spacing. It's amazing. So uh, feel free to check these, play, uh, I guess, outline out and all the other plugins that I've mentioned. Um, and then last slide, next one. So if you haven't already yet, this is my favorite feature in Figma. It's a cursor chat mode. So if you're ever in a Figma follow up, you know, your fellow collaborators hit the forward slash and you get, you kind of um, go into this cursor chat mode and kind of like, you know, live chat with each other. It's kind of fun. And uh, yeah, that's my, that's the end of my uh, lightning talk on Figma. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any of your lovely designers on your team. Uh, we're probably more than happy to kind of walk you through all things Figma and design stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. That's super helpful. Um, and with that, we'll pass it to Sahir. Great. Thanks, Sadara. Hi, everybody. I'm here to talk to you about MozFest 2023. Next slide, please. So if you haven't heard of MozFest, it is Mozilla's largest public facing event. It's a huge convening that's happening from March 20th to 24th virtually. It is a convening of all different types of people, artists, tech people, builders, software developers, civil society, academics, researchers all around the world. It is community designed and community led through the Wrangler program, which is actually the program that I lead. And I noticed on the participant list today, we have some Wranglers as well joining. Um, if that is something that you'd like to get involved in in the future, feel free to reach out to me. In terms of MozFest and the scale, last year we had 8,400 participants across 145 countries. So it's a huge, huge event. And I'm going to tell you more about it. Next slide, please. So this year we have 400 sessions confirmed and 550 facilitators, uh, which are presenters, we call them facilitators, across 52 countries. Next slide, please. And that's a lot of sessions. Um, I'm going to share a few of the ones that I'm really looking forward to with you today. Next slide, please. So, I mean, the caveat is I don't fully understand all of these, but they're interesting to me and I will be registering for them and I thought they might inspire you too. Um, another quick note is at the bottom of the slide here, I hyperlinked uh, a way for you to add this to your MozFest schedule. So after this, I can share these slides and if you like any of these, you can, it'll just be easier for you to add them. So the autonomous tree is going to be, well, it's, it's, a, it's a virtual session. The actual autonomous tree is in person, um, but it will be an art and media piece at MozFest. It is basically a living tree that has sensors on it and an AI chatbot with which you can interact with. And the tree can um, impose financial penalties on humans for the harms that we cause to the environment, which is a very cool concept. So this session will be with the creator who's going to talk to us about the project and also where it's going. Next slide, please. Um, if anybody remembers this big time story about the exploitation of content moderators, um, the whistleblower from the company that Facebook was contracting, who's on the cover of uh, Time Magazine, will be holding a session along with, I'm pretty sure the other journalist is the one who, who covered that story. So that'll be super, super interesting. Next slide, please. Um, Web3 philanthropy. This is one of those that I don't, I do not fully understand, but I'm interested in. Um, this session is going to talk about privacy and security and also the role of philanthropy in Web3 and yeah, Web3. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, okay, this is super cool. So, so we have all of these different spaces, themes, tracks, whatever you want to call them as part of MozFest. And one of them is called AI Cosmologies. And it's all about the relationship that we have with AI, but also connecting that to our relationship with the natural world. It's very abstract, it's very cool. And there's a bunch of sessions under that stream. And one of these is this one, which is kind of a knowledge artifact of um, the wisdom of elders in the West African Hausa community. And there's a there's a language preservation act, uh, aspect to that as well. Super interesting. Next slide, please. Uh, recommender systems. If you're interested in platform accountability, this is an interactive workshop where uh, you'll be able to inform mitigation measures that will be uh, shared with social media platforms, and uh, they will be encouraged to implement those. Next slide, please. 
Right to repair. This is actually something I learned about uh, recently myself, but you know how everything just seems to be really terrible quality these days and breaks down. Um, I, I recently learned there's a whole movement to uh, not have that be the norm and to have companies be more accountable to consumers and allow for products to be repaired instead of forcing consumers to just buy new ones. So there's a whole session that is focused on this, but with the focus on um, software and tech products. So I'll be adding that to my schedule. Next slide, please. Uh, so that was a bunch of options. Uh, like I said, there's over 400. Uh, these are a few others that I thought about adding, but it would have been just way too long. Uh, a lot of privacy related stuff, machine learning translation with Wikipedia, a bunch of Mozilla projects are being featured and discussed in detail. So if any of those are interesting to you, you can sign up for those. A lot of content on AI ethics, obviously, um, and a lot about big tech and all the things they should not do. Next slide, please. There's also going to be a lot of fun. I mean, everything that I just talked about is extremely fun, but on top of that, there will be more fun. And here are some examples. Uh, we'll have Drag Queen Bingo. Honestly, not quite sure exactly what that is, but it's very, very popular and I'm going to be joining. Um, sip and paint. We have one of our, we have our team, uh, they came up with um, mocktail recipes and some art that you can do to kind of decompress. There's going to be an immersive meditation session with nature sounds. There's going to be a cauliflower florette cooking workshop. And if you have children, there's also a bunch of activities for kids. So there's a Minecraft world that's been created just for mine, just for MozFest. There are a bunch of um, activism workshops and also activity books for kids. Next slide. I think that's the last one. So here are the calls for action. Um, come to MozFest, get your MozFest ticket. Uh, it's a rolling event. So it's uh, 12 hours every day and you can just suit the, you can add things to your schedule in a way that makes sense for your workload. Um, I've also included a link to a comms cheat sheet if you would like to promote this with your network. Um, yeah, basically that. And if you want to Zoom backgrounds, we have a link to that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sahir. This is so exciting. I'm so excited to <laughs> sign up for these talks. Also, I just wanted to ask if you wanted to put that blurb into the um, Lightning Talk Slack channel, then people will have access to it as well. And we will be sharing the, the slides afterwards, so everyone will have access to these wonderful um, sessions that Sahir has um, has handpicked. I'm I am so excited. Thank you. And with that, we will be uh, closing out with Nicole. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, happy belated International Women's Day. So I have a topic very uh, on theme. Uh, I, I will give you an overview of a paper called Feminist HCI written by uh, Shawan Basel in 2010. Next slide, please. Uh, Basel is a professor at uh, Penn State right now. She's born and raised in Taipei and moved uh, to the US in 1990. And the paper pretty much uh, does what it says in the title. So it's taking stock by giving an overview of the history of feminism, uh, looking what is happening in related fields and also in the uh, HCI field. And then HCI is human computer interaction and then outlining an agenda for design, proposing a set of uh, feminist inter feminist interaction design qualities that I will get to later. Next slide, please. So in the opening paragraph of the paper, she, she says, as computers increasingly become a part of everyday life for increasing populations in the world, the stakes have never been higher. We must engage in the moral and intellectual complexity of our professional activities. Next slide, please. So stakes are high and she sees feminism as natural alley uh, to interaction design. So she says that interaction design implicitly already applies a lot of methods that feminism has, but more in, in like a piecemeal ad hoc way. And she advocates for making this a conscious effort, especially since feminism has plenty to offer uh, as an established movement and academic discipline. Next slide. So for example, the feminist standpoint theory, which is which basically says that knowledge creation is socially situated. So it is enmeshed in acts of power and in patriarchal societies, women's knowledge is suppressed. 
and the feminist standpoint theory kind of advocates for the use of women's perspective as alternative points of departure for research. Next slide, please. Uh, and she continues to look at related fields to learn from areas like industrial design, architecture, or game design. Next slide, please. So and there's a lot of weird stuff. Um, for example, when the microwave, um, so this is an example from the paper, I didn't make that up. When the microwave uh, came out, it was marketed to single men as because it's a high tech device and in order to help them make a warm meal because you know men can't cook and love tech of course uh, next slide please or uh, the whole discussion around game design um, that people probably remember um, for example this you know the, the introduction of pressed and butt physics that uh, cater towards the male gaze and feminist perspectives here can clearly help to critique and dismantle stuff like that. Next slide, please. So, and uh, Basel kind of lists out all the contributions that feminist theories can make to HCI. So it's, it's kind of like everywhere actually, it's theory by critiquing and questioning designs and design processes through feminist lens, through user research. So consider gender when talking about the user, this is usually like the genderless user, which is an illusion, right? Um, Methods incorporate feminist perspectives in, in all the design phases and evaluation to make unintended consequences and impact on user visible. Next slide, please. So, and then she lists out all the qualities of feminist HCI, which I will go in more detail on the next slide. So the, the quality of pluralism refers to um, that that you should you know when you design stuff you should resist any single totalizing or universal point of view, uh, and she she quote, quoted uh, pluralist designs are likely to be to be more human centered than universalizing designs simply because human is too rich too diverse too complex a category to bear a universal solution. Next slide, please. And she also um, talks about the, the value of participatory and co-design processes and respecting the, the expertise of different people, including non-professional ones, regardless of background status and technical know-how. Advocacy, please. The next slide, please. And uh, also to advocate for pluralism, but also to be aware of your own bias. Uh, but she says that if you do like participatory design, co-design, that helps to balance out the bias that, that you might bring in. Um, next slide. Ecology, which is like considering the, the um, integrating an awareness of design artifacts effects in their broadest context to you know, mitigate unintended consequences. Next slide, please. Embodiment, people have bodies, so it's not all heads and genderlessness. So there, there is also, a, you know, also a thing that's already there, like um, talking about desires, emotions, and everything that kind of affects people. And next slide, please. Last quality is um, self-disclosure. So this is the extent to which software renders visible the ways in which it affects the user. So software does not work for everyone. And, and software also gives users an identity. Uh, think, uh, for example, about TurboTax that works well for a very special kind of person, but once you're not in that spectrum, it can get tough and, and users need to know for whom the software is optimized. Next slide. So, um, yeah, these are kind of like the qualities of feminist HCI. And I would recommend, um, you know, if, if you found it interesting to read the paper, there are a ton of references and, and opportunities to dive deeper and to think about how to integrate that in day-to-day -day work in, in small steps maybe, but yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. Um, I mean, thank you to all of our speakers. These were such wonderful topics. Um, thank you for putting the time and, and sharing um, your learnings with us. Um, as always, if uh, if you'd like to sign up for a talk, please feel free to reach out to the organizers or there's a link for the sign up sheet. Uh, if you have any questions, we're more than happy to help you with that. And if you have any questions or comments um, about what you heard today, feel free to put it in the Lightning Talk Slack channel and reach out to our speakers for more information. 
Thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you next week. Have a great rest of the week, uh, next month.